So, um, we'll start off with a, a case study here. Let's see what see, we'll test your knowledge here. All right, 32 year, uh, 32 year old female runner, uh, dull aching sensation on the outside of her left ankle and a less painful ache on the inside of the same ankle. Uh, three months prior, she caught her right heel walking down the stairs. Uh, excessive plantar flexion with inversion was the mechanism of injury, uh, produced pain in the lateral ankle. No immediate swelling, but it was markedly puffy a few hours later. Uh, she tried to ice the ankle and applied compression. Uh, she was off her feet uh, for two weeks, gradually ramped it back up within three weeks. Um, since the time of injury, had no other traumatic episodes, but she was concerned that the outside of the ankle was still ached and swelled from time to time. Uh, present uh, pre presented in a uh, clinic with decreased left ankle dorsiflexion, uh, also demonstrated prolonged mid-tarsal pronation uh, during stance phase of gait. Single leg standing on the left revealed poor balance and a feeling of unsteadiness, and range inversion and plantar flexion were painful. Uh, palpation of the lateral ligaments, the ATFL, revealed no tenderness, but there was some swelling. Uh, passive range of motion of the inferior fibula posteriorly was restricted, and um, uh, when they uh, passively did that and combined it with inversion, it eliminated pain. So does anybody have an idea of what's going on here? Anybody want to venture a guess, brave soul? Maybe a diagnosis? I'll call him one of you. <laughs> Anybody, you said you were thinking about PT, maybe have an idea? Mm, I'm not really sure. She seemed like she rolled her ankle. They're still swelling for a little bit, but. All right, let's see what we got for an answer. Oh, no, sorry, wrong. <laughs> 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 All right. The point of this I'm trying to drive home here is I'm taking this um, uh, perspective as a strength conditioning coach. And uh, before I delve into any connective tissue thing, I kind of hung you out to dry here <laughs> on purpose. This is a little bit supposed to be a little bit humorous. Um, <laughs> as a strength conditioning coach, we have to respect the boundaries of scope of practice. All right, we don't have the right to diagnose people. We don't have the right to treat people. Um, but that being said, we can learn about other fields like physical therapy and integrate some concepts. Uh, from that field into um, what we do in the gym. Um, so there is, in recent years, there's a trend towards an overlap between those fields. There are some people that even kind of do both jobs. They'll be a PT and a CSCS. Um, but you always have to be prepared to yield to someone who's more qualified than you. So I just want you to keep that in mind when we delve into this. Um, if strength and conditioning is where you want to go, um, this is stuff that can be useful to you, but you always have to be aware that you have to yield to someone who has higher authority. And you also want to be careful when you're talking with you know, clients and athletes that you're not giving them uh, the idea that you, know, you think that you can supersede someone who's higher than you. So you just have to be careful and keep that in mind. All right. So when you're addressing uh, connected tissue health, and uh, connected tissue is a, is a really broad term that can uh, be def you know, defined to include a lot of things. Uh, technically, blood's a connected tissue if you want to get really um, technical about it. But for the purposes of this, um, presentation, we're going to basically just consider tendon, ligament, and uh, joint capsule uh, as connective tissue. Um, and when you're taking it into consideration in terms of programming in a strength conditioning environment, you have to look at it uh, from a very broad perspective. You want to um, consider uh, all facets of the training process. And I kind of like to base it around um, the assumption that there will be an injury. Obviously, you'd like that not to be the case, but you know, it's to a certain extent, especially in contact sports, kind of inevitable. Um, so I break it into three parts here. You have the before the injury, or the absence of the injury, we're focused on prevention. So that really consists of postural movement assessment, a lot of what Rob talked about in the PRI stuff, um, analyzing movement um, and uh, planning interventions based on those findings. Um, Peri-injury, or during the injury, your goal is to mitigate uh, losses in performance. All right, so when you're resting and unloading the joint that's injured, you want to uh, prevent performance losses. And then post-injury, and these two kind of overlap here, peri and, and post-injury, but you know, the goal is rehabilitation. We want to get people back to play as fast as we can. And we'll delve into each of these um, in greater detail. So uh, as, in terms of uh, prevention pre-injury here, I want to start with a quote from Doug. I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. Okay, he's, um, 
uh, physical therapist at Peak Performance. He's a very brilliant guy. He's actually, uh, um, uh, is he pure PRC? He's PRC. Yeah, okay, so he's um, a former uh, Cressy intern. Former Cressy intern, yeah, also. Um, but joints don't put themselves in crappy positions. It's not a joint problem until the only solution is a scalpel. What he's really trying to drive home here is that movement patterns, faulty movement patterns, what we call faulty movement patterns, when athletes don't move the way we want to, um, typically aren't actual structural issues. They're actually driven by you know neurological patterns. So when we want to fix these things, we're really trying to retrain people neurologically. And we don't want to think of it as a structural issue and let, until it gets to that point where it actually becomes a structural issue. So what does this consist of? We want to analyze resting posture, uh, passive and active ranges of motion, movement patterns, and strength and stability. I bolded the last two because um, if you look at the research, it hasn't been too kind uh, over the last decade, I'd say, for uh, resting posture and passive ranges of motion. Really, how an athlete moves on their own is going to be uh, the most important thing to take away from an assessment. It's not that uh, posture is not important at all, but it's, it's less of a determinant uh, typically to you know, injuries or, and things like that. Um, so asymmetries in and of themselves aren't bad. Um, we ha all have them. Um, but what can happen is they create a disparity in the ratio of load. All right, so if you have the classic uh, example of anterior pelvic tilt where the pelvis is tilted forward, right, and the hamstrings or the posterior chain is lengthened, that's the hamstrings are forced to take on a greater load. Okay, so you're kind of stressing out, uh, creating disparity in terms of the stress you're placing on different muscle groups uh, in terms of agonists and antagonists. Right? And eventually, if you increase load to a certain point in terms of training, so if you, you know, increase the volume of training, if you uh, go from the off-season to in-season, you ramp up the you know, workload of the athlete um, significantly, that's when you can overload the tissues and it'll you know, lead to injury. So the goal with um, this whole analysis and um, movement patterns and looking at things like this is to identify and correct asymmetries and deficiencies as best we can and when necessary. Uh, and again, it's a neurological thing, so we want to retrain neuromuscular patterns and neural circuits so we can restore balance in terms of the ratio of load across joints. And then the last note here is people a lot of times use the term injury prevention. I don't really like that term. We need to understand that decreasing injury risk is not the same as injury prevention. You're never going to prevent injuries. They happen, especially in contact sports. You just want to put the athlete in the best position you can to keep them healthy as best you can. All right, so how do we do that? Our goal is to design our training in order to accommodate structural abnormalities or asymmetries that the athlete might have. And it's important to note that asymmetries and abnormalities are not the exception but the rule. So it's especially important to take these things into consideration because most, if not all, athletes that you'll come across will have them to some degree. I have two studies here that kind of highlight that. First study here uh, looked at shoulders in professional baseball players, asymptomatic, so note that they had no pain, any uh, you know, uh, outgoing outward signs of injury. Uh, they MRI'd these players, 79% of their shoulders, both throwing and non-throwing, showed abnormal labrums. Okay, so there was structural pathology even in the absence of actual uh, injury or pain. Uh, another uh, population here, we have collegiate and professional hockey players. They looked at the hip. Um, groin dysfunction, which is loosely defined as kind of uh, abdominal groin region, was found in 36% of players. Hip pathology, uh, cam lesions, um, FAI impingement was found in 64% of players. Uh, again, these were all asymptomatic athletes, no pain no outward presentation of any kind of symptoms. All right? So th and this is across the board in a lot of sports. There are studies that have looked at football, uh, you name it. All right? uh, structural abnormalities are, like it says, the is, are the rule, not the exception. All right? So it becomes important to screen for and identify and structure our training accordingly so that we don't make these uh, abnormalities worse. Because uh, this study right here outlines what will happen if you fail to do that. All right, prevalence of increased alpha angles uh, looked at cam impingement in youth ice hockey players. And basically what this data is showing here 
is that impingement and labral tears are progressive over time. So you'll notice that they get older, the age groups get older, and the incidence increases. Okay, and when you get to the highest levels, professional, uh, collegiate, high, high level collegiate players, um, it's extremely high prevalence, 70s, 80s, and 90%. All right, so if you don't take these things into account in your training, they will progress over time. And even though they're asymptomatic in a lot of these studies, eventually they probably will become symptomatic and present some sort of injury uh, at some point. All right, so that's all I'll really say about um, pre-injury because Rob touched on a lot of the postural assessment movement analysis, stuff like that in his uh, last presentation. We'll move on to peri-injury uh, or during the injury where you're trying to mitigate um, losses in strength, size, um, different performance measures like that. Um, again, this is most crucial uh, during the late preseason and in season when your athlete just needs to perform. We need to keep them uh, at the level that we have them or we got them to training wise uh, and we don't want to see them slide. So if you just look at this study, uh, they looked at um, detraining in athletes who were injured and who were uh, off their feet. I believe it was a four weeks. Uh, it was just four weeks and they noticed a bunch of uh, really uh, significant decreases in performance. VO2 max dropped, uh, blood volume, cardiac dimensions, so the heart actually shrank, um, ventilatory efficiency, um, endurance performance suffered, muscle glycogen levels, lactate threshold. So you can see across the board, uh, endurance performance, cardiovascular fitness, um, muscle endurance, and to a lesser extent strength, though strength tends to be a little bit more persistent um, and drops off more slowly. But you can see even in just four weeks, performance drops a lot, so we need to do whatever we can to keep them at the level that, that, that we got them to originally. Now one kind of newer, uh, it's actually not newer, but it's kind of gaining in popularity now for the first time um, in strength and conditioning circles. Way to do this is called blood flow restriction training, uh, or occlusion training, some people call it. And basically what this consists of is exactly what it looks like. You wrap a band or a tourniquet or uh, some kind of wrap around either uh, your upper arm um, or uh, just below the gluteal folds, just below your butt, on your legs. And what that does is, I'll actually go back here. What that does is it, um, you want to wrap it to a pressure that allows blood to get to the muscles from the heart, but it doesn't allow it to significantly get back through the venous uh, system. All right, and so what that does is it creates a hypoxic environment um, it can't oxygenate the tissues, and I'll get into what that does in a little bit. All right, so the science behind blood flow restriction training. Uh, the research shows potential effects it has on muscle tissue, muscle tissue, uh, preferential activation of type 2 fibers. This is big because type 2 fibers are the largest fibers. They produce the most force. Um, typically, you need uh, high levels of load, 70 to 75% of one rep max or greater. Obviously, if a player or an athlete's injured, you can't really load it that heavily. So this is kind of a way to circumvent that problem and get those type 2 fibers without loading it heavily. Because um, when you wrap it and you um, uh, fatigue the muscle, you're creating a, an oxygen poor environment. It fatigues really easily, so you don't have to use a heavy load, typically 20 to 40 percent of blood rep max. Um, increases mechanical stress on the uh, sarcolemma or the um, membrane of the muscle cell. Inhibits myostatin, which is a uh, protein uh, that inhibits uh, muscle cell uh, growth and pro uh, proliferation, decreases proteolysis, so it has an anti-catabolic effect, um, increases protein synthesis, so it also has an anabolic effect, um, increases GA, uh, growth hormone production, really important for connective tissue. A lot of people have um, the wrong idea about growth hormone. Um, it's actually not that anabolic for muscle tissue. It doesn't really increase myofibrillar protein synthesis. What it does do is it increases uh, connective tissue or collagen protein synthesis, so it strengthens connective tissue. So that's a very uh, important point to highlight. Uh, activates myonuclei and satellite cells, so those are basically the uh, progenitor cells for muscles. Um, so again, muscle cell growth. And it increases uh, basically metabolic stress on the muscle. Uh, the performance benefits we get from this, hypertrophy, muscles will grow. Uh, strength maintenance, because we're not exactly loading the joints uh, with heavy loads, we're not going to increase strength, but we can maintain it because we are getting those type 2 fibers, which is really all we're trying to do when an athlete's injured. We just want to maintain the strength levels so they don't drop off. And then lastly, uh, improved muscular and cardiorespiratory endurance. 
So like I mentioned, the restriction of blood flow uh, to, uh, from the target limb back to the heart uh, causes metabolites like lactate uh, to accumulate inside the muscle cells. All right, this creates a pressure gradient and basically drives blood flow into muscle cells to offset that gradient. And what happens is the cell then swells, and this is something in the research called cellular swelling theory. Um, that swelling induces an anabolic response inside the muscle. Um, so you can see some of the effects here. Increased protein synthesis, again, an anabolic effect. Decreased proteolysis and myostatin expression, so an anti-catabolic effect. It works from both ends. Um, and this isn't really that important. That's just kind of a biochemical pathway. Um, so back to the type 2 fibers. Uh, size principle, like I mentioned, type 2 fibers are typically only activated at or above 70 to 75 percent of one rep, one rep max, which is problematic when we're dealing with an injured athlete. Uh, this circumvents the problem because uh, BFR actually mimics how our body works when we lift a heavy load. Uh, when the muscle contracts, it restricts blood flow actually back from the muscle to the heart. It restricts venous return. All right, this is doing the exact same thing, only we're not using a heavy load. Um, so type 2 fibers are activated by the hypoxic or uh, oxygen poor environment that's created inside the muscle and uh, not the intensity of the load like would be typical in you know, traditional resistance training. Uh, and then lastly, it increases uh, metabolic acidosis or metabolic stress in the muscle uh, due to increase of uh, metabolites, lactate, uh, things like that. Again, increases growth hormone production and protein synthesis. Um, so an anabolic effect, and it upregulates heat shock proteins, uh, which are responsible for um, kind of uh, protecting uh, the integrity of proteins uh, from thermal stress. Um, so when the temperature inside the muscle gets too high. Uh, the oxygen poor environment leads to uh, increased muscle glycogen stores and increased capillarization uh, because it activates uh, vascular endothelial growth factors, which are a protein uh, that causes uh, proliferation of uh, blood vessels, uh, and uh, HIF1 alpha does the same thing. So basically, improves cardiorespiratory and muscular endurance. So, in terms of practical applications, what can you take away from this that you can use, like I said, right out in the gym? Um, the research does suggest that it is safe. I got a good question from Eric Cressy when I presented this uh, at, in, in service at uh, Cressy Sports Performance. Um, a lot of baseball pitchers have um, uh, a, um, a certain condition where the, what's the name of it, do you know? What TOS. The, TOS, that thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, where the first rib will actually impinge on some uh, vascular structures that run through there. And so his concern was, hey, if I'm cutting off the blood flow in the arms of these players, uh, is that going to cause problems? Because they already kind of have that, their ribs kind of pushing down on it. And some of the research actually... Um, supports using this for people who have uh, cardiac issues because it causes proliferation of blood vessels and things like that. So it actually is safe if you do it properly. You don't want to recklessly tighten the cuff. Um, if you can't feel your arm when you're you know, tightening it, uh, if your arm is kind of pulsing, if it's numb, obviously too tight, not a good thing. You don't want Tingling to as well. Tingling, yeah. <laughs> no, don't want to go there. Um, yeah, it can cause nerve damage, blood clots, bad stuff. You don't want to go there. Um, in terms of practical uh, how tight to do it, the research uses a machine called a Katsu where they can like type in specific uh, pressure uh, levels. Obviously, they cost like $10,000. Obviously, we're not going to use that in the gym. So they have come out with uh, more practical uh, recommendations. So what they say is on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the loosest, 10 being the absolute tightest you can get the wrap, you want a 4 out of 10 when you're doing the arms in a seven out of 10 when you're doing the legs, all right? And when you're wrapping the arms, you want to get, make sure you get the brachial, uh, where the brachial vein and artery run, kind of right where the fold of the shoulder is. And then when you get the arms, you want to get, again, right under the butt, on, under the gluteal fold. Um, you want to remove the cuff immediately after you finish a set of an exercise, all right? That causes uh, even more swelling because once you take the cuff off, the blood flows into the muscle. And again, swelling is good. It creates an anabolic response. Uh, you want to keep the volume high and the load low, 20 to 40% of one rep max. Um, when you first start out, it'll feel like you're, you're kind of doing nothing, but it'll start to burn really quick. Um, this is a, kind of an important point. Avoid eccentric dominant exercises. The interesting thing is eccentric exercise uh, in, in traditional resistance training uh, is 
more anabolic or creates more growth, at least the research has shown, than concentric exercise. Um, the opposite's actually true with BFR. They found that concentric exercise, as opposed to tempo eccentric exercise, creates a greater response. Um, there's some debate over why that might be. Um, it kind of it has to do with uh, the size principle, and I won't go into too much of that. Um, but the main takeaway is stick with concentric exercise. Don't uh, go with eccentric tempo exercises. Um, and then lastly, you can use this outside of injured. Um, athletes, we kind of use it sometimes at the end to get a nice pump uh, in the arms. Uh, not that it's working out too well for me, but um, you just want to consider when you're using this with an athlete, it does cause a lot of soreness, particularly if you haven't done it before. Uh, the way I described it when we did it first time around the arms is like it felt like my bone was sore. It was so deep, like it was, it was, it was, it was quite a sensation. Um, and that might not be desirable when you're working with an athlete in season. You don't want um, significant soreness. So just something to keep in mind. So this is, uh, we actually just did this uh, 15 minutes ago. An example of something that you would do with BFR. So you'd wrap, uh, start with dumbbell bicep curl. You'd wrap the um, arms at a 4 out of 10 right below the shoulder. You do 30 reps at 20 to 40 percent of one rep max. I think I used what, 20 to 15 pounds? Yeah, 15 um, but don't try to lie. Yeah, right? <laughs> Uh, rest 30 seconds, do 15 reps, rest another 30 seconds, do a last set of 15 reps, and take off the cuffs. That's it. Uh, you can take this out really as far as you can while maintaining that 15 rep level. As soon as you can't get 15 reps, you probably want to stop. Um, but you can go out to um, five, six, even seven um, mini sets, I guess you call them. And then again, cable tricep press downs, you wrap it in the same place. Um, same setup, 30 reps, 30 seconds of rest, 15, 30 seconds of rest, 15, take the cuff off, you're done. So pretty simple. Yeah, just, um, I'm just gonna, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. just to butt in here. Um, for lower body stuff, I think a good option would be sled pushes, because we're talking about concentric versus eccentric, so maybe not, I mean, you could use them for something like squats or some sort of single leg exercise, but something like a sled push is pretty good, pretty good fit for that. Yeah, yeah going off that actually, um, like I said, when you first start doing this, it'll, you'll get really sore, so you want to start with the lighter load. Uh, with lower body, they actually recommend just wrapping and just walking. Um, that's a sufficient stimulus for a lot of people the first time they do it that they'll get sore just from walking around, um, or a body weight squat or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. But you, you do want to start um, light and kind of progress your weight just as you would with anything else. All right, one other thing we can do to kind of circumvent the uh, issue of uh, uh, performance losses when we have an injury is contralateral training. Um, there's something in the research called the contralateral crossover effect um, where if you have an injury, say I injure my right knee, if you train the left leg you actually get crossover to the right leg. And some of you might have you know, be familiar with this. Um, it's a neural um, it's not an actual muscular thing, like if you train the left leg, it's not, you're not actually making the muscle in the right leg bigger. Uh, it's, it's neuromuscular in nature. Um, there's two uh, competing theories that actually might both be um, working together, but basically spillover of neural drive to the untrained side, and then uh, the theory that neuromuscular adaptations that you create when you train that one side can be accessed by the other side once the uh, injury is healed. Um, but again, a study of this meta-analysis um, the typical size of the training effect is about 8% of the initial strength of that um, side that got injured or about 50% of the increase in, in strength of the train side. So if you um, add 10 pounds to a squat on the left leg, you'll typically get about 5 pounds of crossover to the right leg. All right, so again, another way to kind of circumvent this issue of performance losses. And then moving on to post-injury, and again, there's a little bit of an overlap between um, peri and post injury, you can kind of use these um, methods either or. Um, but again, we're just trying to expedite the healing process. We want to get people back to the field. Um, anything we do in the gym, if they can't be out on the court, doesn't mean anything for you know, field or whatever they play on ice. Um, so how do we do that? We want to facilitate the restructuring and rehab of the actual connective tissue itself, but we have to understand the actual physiology of the connective tissue in order to do that. So we'll delve into that a little bit. Tendons and ligaments. 
are both like and unlike muscle tissue. They're like muscle tissue in that they respond to loading. So when you exercise, um, they respond to that whatever load you place on it and they restructure themselves, all right? So they can adapt um, and grow. Um, and they also balance competing demands. So like uh, competing demands in a muscle such as uh, endurance and strength. So the, you know, they're not, they balance. You can't have a huge muscle that's also gonna run a marathon. Same thing um, with tendons and ligaments and the balance there is between stiffness and compliance. So basically that means the stiffer a muscle it is, the better, uh, tendon rather, or connective tissue, the stiffer it is, the better it is at uh, transferring force across the joint. So that's better for performance. Uh, the more pliable it is, uh, the more flexible it is, the less likely it is to be injured, but it's also worse at transferring force across the joint. So we have a kind of balance effect here where we want to have the right sweet spot of both stiffness and pliability. However, tendons and ligaments differ from muscle in that they're not continuously adaptive. So if you uh, exercise a muscle, it's going to continue to respond to the stimulus that you place on it. Obviously, it's going to fatigue, but it's going to continue to respond for as long as you have that stimulus on. Tendons and ligaments aren't like that. Um, I'll get into this in the next slide, but uh, they actually shut off within the first 10 minutes of exercise. After that, they're not responsive to the stimulus you place on it. There's also no greater response. So you get, uh, according to the size principle, an increased activation um, of muscle tissue um, as you increase the load. Tendons and ligaments aren't like that. They uh, are responsive the same way to a load, no matter what the uh, intensity or frequency or anything like that is. So like I mentioned, within 10 minutes, the cells inside connected tissue turn off and they have a refractory period of six hours. So they can't start responding to exercise again and remodeling and restructuring for another six hours. Uh, back to the stiffness versus compliance issue. Uh, it's centered around, biochemically speaking, uh, collagen molecules. So collagen is the main component of connective tissue and uh, they contain crosslinks. So um, I believe it's lysine residues in collagen molecules are crosslinked together and that makes them more stiff. So they're you know linked together. They're more stiff. Um, slow movements cause a uh, connective tissue to uh, the collagen molecules within a connective tissue act more independently of one another so it creates a shear force and that breaks the crosslink, so it makes them more compliant. It makes them uh, less prone to injury, like I talked about. Fast movements, on the other hand, uh, promote uh, the collagen molecules within uh, connective tissue acting as a single unit. So that promotes stiffness, and it preserves the crosslinks, and actually um, can make them more stiff and actually uh, make more crosslinks. Uh, one important point here, regardless of the speed, so whether it's a fast or slow movement, uh, lysyl oxidase, the enzyme that makes those crosslinks, uh, will increase its activity. So you'll be making crosslinks no matter what. The thing is that slow movements both break and reform crosslinks, so you have kind of a net uh, balance. It's an equilibrium. It's not getting more compliant or more stiff. With fast movements, you're adding new crosslinks on top of existing crosslinks, so you're making the connective tissue more stiff. So what does this mean in terms of our uh, training inside the gym. When we have an athlete who's injured, uh, has a tendon ligament joint injury, we want to emphasize slow movements so we can maintain the compliant region of the tendon. Uh, when you have a tendon, so the tendon attaches a muscle to a bone, the portion that's uh, closer to the muscle is more compliant, it's more, uh, has fewer crosslinks. As you get closer to the bone, it's more stiff. It takes on the property of the tissue that it's approaching. So those slow movements will break those crosslinks um, in the compliant region nearest the muscle. They'll make it more pliable, more flexible, so it'll be less prone to injury. Um, and what you can do is incorporate, uh, there's a guy, a researcher, I believe he's at UCLA named Keith Barr, who does a lot of research into this, um, and I got this from him. Uh, he promotes, they're called connective tissue health training session, sessions. Basically what it is, it's five to ten minutes of any kind of exercise targeted to a specific area that is injured or prone to injury. Um, in the five to ten minute window, again, like I said, the cells inside a connective tissue start to shut down after ten minutes, so there's no point in going beyond that. You're just exercising for the ten minutes because you're not getting any benefit beyond that. Um, they can be done, again, with light load and limited range of motion because there's no greater response in a connective tissue doesn't respond to an increased load, so there's no point in loading a joint, especially if it's injured, if you're not going to get any increased benefit. 
Uh, how do you apply this? In season, you just want to make sure that you perform it either six hours before or after any other type of training. Again, there's a six hour refractory period where the connective tissue isn't going to be responsive. So there's no point um, in you know, training it additionally when you're not going to get any response from it. Uh, if you're rehabbing an injury, what you do is you space it out six hours apart. So that'll typically translate to three sessions a day. Again, five to ten minutes um, working the, whatever joint might be injured. Um, you space them six hours apart. You take advantage both of the five to ten minute window where it is active and also the six hour refractory period where you're not getting any additional benefit. And then lastly, in terms of general programming, you want to maintain a balance at all times between fast and slow velocity movements. So when you get a player, uh, say a football player who goes from training camp and they start the season and they ramp up uh, their performance drastically, um, when they get into a game, it's all fast movements, and that really jacks up considerably. So you really kind of have to balance that out with slow velocity movements. You want to incorporate slow velocity movements into their training to break those crosslinks that are forming when they're performing and making their tissues more stiff. We want to bring them back towards that sweet spot between pliability um, and stiffness. And as a little bonus, I'll actually touch on a little bit of nutrition because it um, links right in here. There are a couple of uh, supplements or um, food sources that have been shown to uh, help in this kind of um, method. First one is whey protein. There uh, isn't a lot of data out to support that. I think there was only one study that I saw, um, but it may improve tendon function by stimulating um, collagen protein synthesis. Uh, they theorize it's due to the high leucine content in whey protein, but again, there's not a lot of data on that. Um, the real kind of hotbed of research right now is in this area right here. So connective tissue and collagen in particular is made up of um, some pretty unique amino acids. You have proline and lysine are pretty typical, but hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline um, are rather unusual and um, they're found in high amounts in gelatin. Um, so is anybody, it's basically a uh, how you describe it, jello, like so it's, it's jello. It yeah, jello, it and like, it's made from like connected tissues of animals. Yeah, basically. You can, if you ever make a, this might be a little out there, but if you ever like make a soup with a base of bones or like joints, whatever, chicken feet, that's what I use, <laughs> um, and it'll release the gelatin. So it actually, if you put it in the refrigerator, so it cools down, it'll form like a jello-like thing. He's also weird, so uh, <laughs> progressive. What you can do is just buy it in a powder form and mix it into a drink. That's what I typically do. You can have your chicken feet. Um, yeah, I prefer to do the normal way. Um, and then the other thing is vitamin C is a cofactor in this whole kind of collagen synthesis thing. It works as a cofactor, I believe. Um, in the enzyme that makes these two amino acids. Um, and so supplementing also with vitamin C can kind of increase the rate of collagen synthesis and healing of connective tissue. Um, and these are two, the two primary theories. One, you're providing substrates so the actual um, building blocks of what the connective tissue is made out of. And two, uh, they theorize that it's decreasing the body's autoimmunity to its own um, building blocks of connecting tissue with these amino acids. Um, the other point that the research highlights is that tendons and ligaments are relatively avascular. They have a limited blood flow. That's why they don't heal uh, very quickly. Um, and they get their nutrients in what's called bulk fluid flow. So as the tissue is loaded, the fluid moves out, or it's forced out, rather. As the tissue is unloaded or relaxes, fluid gets drawn in. And the point to highlight here is that the nutrient in question, so these are the ones we want to um, have you know, get moved into this connective tissue, have to be present before the exercise in order for it to be delivered into the tissue. So what they recommend is you take it 30 to 60 minutes before you do a training session or exercise or anything like that. So this process can occur and it can be driven into the connective tissue, yeah. So if you have like whey protein, instead of taking it after you work out, this is saying you have to take it? Uh, this, that particular um, theory more applies to this because there's more data on this. Hi theoretically, yes. Um, but again, there's not a ton of data to support that whey protein is particularly effective in tendon function, so I, that's, I give you a um, very cautious yes, I guess. Um, there's a lot more data to support it with this particular, um, these particular building blocks. Um, but I will highlight those, uh, the practical applications here. Uh, so consuming greater than or equal to two grams of gelatin in liquid or gel form 30 to 60 minutes before 
connective tissue sessions or general exercise, and also including 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C will allow it to be driven into the connective tissues, provides a substrate for these connective tissues um, to basically build themselves back up and repair themselves. And again, ingesting whey protein may be beneficial, um, but that's not as well established at this point. So for the gelatin, is it like any kind of jello, like an easy make jello, is that what you mean? I wouldn't use that as your main source of gelatin. Um, <laughs> well, you can, that's, what I'm, that's all I'm like picturing. So. Right, yeah. so, oh, so you can, well, you can buy, they'll just sell bulk gelatin powder. Um, so that's like what gets used in jello, but you can just buy pure gelatin like that. Yeah, I, I don't know what the percentage of actually gel, uh, like actual gelatin in like Jello yeah. would be. Um, yeah. If you want like pure gelatin, I buy like just bulk gelatin. Yeah, you can get it online. Although actually, a lot of grocery stores have yeah. pure <laughs> so gelatin. Like, yeah, you know, just eat uh, the just brand like Jello sugar-free strawberry gelatin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, the brand I use is called Knox for reference. I don't Knox gelatin. Is it K N O X? K N O X. Yeah, and then there's yeah. Great Lakes as well. Yeah. Okay. It's really, it's really cheap. It's not expensive. Um, I've used it with a couple of my athletes. We've had good results so far. Again, it's not like a controlled research study, but um, works for us. So we're, we're going to continue with that. Um, and there is data to support it. Um, yeah, and then partnering again with the vitamin C also provides the cofactor for that reaction to take place. All right. So just some general conclusions here. The prevalence of connective tissue injury is uh, extremely high, so we really have to take this into consideration when we're constructing our training programs and strength and conditioning coaches. A um, couple of studies here. Um, in American football, about 70% of all injuries are sprains or strains of connective tissue. Uh, in European soccer, greater than 60%. Um, the list kind of goes on. It's uh, you know a big problem, so taking these kind of emerging research um, methods and theories into account in your training uh, can be really beneficial. Um, I want to re-highlight that injuries are not totally avoidable, but utilizing methods like these and other methods that are out there that you know I have not come across uh, to this point can reduce the risk, and that's really our goal. We just want to do the best we can to keep our athletes and clients healthy. And then lastly, you want to consider all phases of the training process. So like I mentioned, I look at it from you know revolving around the injury, you have pre-injury or in the absence of injury, um, peri-injury during the injury, trying to mitigate um, losses, and then post-injury where you're just trying to rehab them and get them back. So you want to take a broad spectrum approach and really step back and um, take into consideration all phases of your programming. That's all I have for you. So if you have any questions, I know I kind of laid a lot out there in terms of um, studies and science and stuff like that. So